problem. The problem is, of course, the problem with uh, finding these headsets is they're intermittent problems, so I wasn't able to repeat the problem that we had. So if we have any problems, just either send me a, a chat notice or you know, speak up if you hear any static or, or whatever, and uh, we'll see if we can fix it. I've got my backup network and, and all that, but hopefully we won't have any problems. Okay, um, back to the regularly, regularly scheduled program. Okay, so um, um, so for Tuesday, uh, today, um, <clears throat> like I said, uh, <coughs> excuse me, let's, uh, here's the agenda for today. Um, I'd like to cover any questions, review, announcements, uh, project meetings. Uh, oh, yeah, so, so the two things are, um, <coughs> um, um, we had, I sent out a request to do a, a quick project meeting update, and I've gotten responses from everybody except for one group. So, if you know who you are, um, just let me know uh, when's a good time to talk. Um, and uh, and uh, I think we'll be all set then. Um, okay, and the next thing is um, assignment number four. I want to kind of go through that. I've got it ready. And my apologies again for for just not being able to do the uh, the feedback yet. Like I said, every time I started it, it, it my head would hit the floor, and and uh, I've just been in bad shape the last couple of days. So my my apologies for that. Um, but let me show you the uh, <clears throat> excuse me the um, assignment. I like to walk through it. It should not be. Okay, you guys got to tell me when you're not seeing the screen. Okay, I can see it now. Okay, great. Awesome. So here's our agenda. We're going to be going through this. The first thing is uh, project meetings. We already talked about that in assignment number four. All righty. Um, so let me show you the assignment. I want to walk through the assignment with you. It's significantly shorter than the one that you just did. So, um, uh, so it should be sort of downhill in terms of this uh, this stuff. Um, so, um, here's assignment uh, number four. I want to walk through it. Um, I'm tentatively setting it for the 7th and to be due on the 7th. Uh, now, I have no problem whatsoever if you want to make it due on the 10th, if you want a little bit of extra time. The 7th is two weeks from today. That would be a Tuesday. If you want to have till the Friday, that's okay. Um, but for those of you who want to push yourselves a little bit, I don't think it's that pushing, uh, that much pushing. Um, so uh, there's some reading um, and there's some supplementary videos. Um, it's basically course slides week seven and eight. Um, some of the videos are optional. There's a special DOE exercise which I want to show you um, <clears throat> in here. And then there's some exercises from the binder. Again, some are optional. And we just have the one chapter in bringing out the best in people. We'll talk about that today. Again, remember, and then finally at the end, there's a reflective discussion. So I want you to have a discussion kind of with yourself. Um, you can use somebody else as well. You can talk to me if you want and call me up and, and have a discussion. Um, that's all fine. Um, uh, but I want you to spend a little bit of time and talk about, you know, what you really think that you are getting or wanted to get from this course, what you did or didn't get. And... Um, and uh, how you're going to use it in the future. Um, so, um, you know, what are different ways of thinking and acting uh, because of this? Um, so, um, it's, it's quite important to do that. All right. Um, here are the videos, and you can see there aren't that many. Um, there aren't that many, certainly week seven. Um, <clears throat> this one on Teams, FMEA, and decision making is the one I would like you to listen to. Uh, the rest are optional. Um, and then in week eight, there are some special topics. Uh, the last two lectures are really sort of special topics um, in, um, in um, operations management, in lean. Some people might call it advanced lean. And then a, a design for Six Sigma. Um, so we're going to be covering that next week. Um, or, or on Friday and then next Tuesday, I should say. Um, now, even with the reading, you've got some of the optional things. The, me the measurement systems uh, section, um, 
is all in Minitab, and I know most of you don't have that. Um, and so I really don't want to get into the depths of the Minitab analysis. And I have to tell you that I, if we have a little time today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about measurement systems and just kind of show you basically um, uh, how to, the basics of how to set up what you need to set up and then how to do the analysis instead of going into specific, oh, this is uh, the measurement system and this is gauge R&R, &R, which I find is difficult with all but a few people, um, uh, that conversation. Um, but let's show you the basics, and then it's more thinking on your own feet and saying, okay, here's what I would do if I were in this situation. And I think you'll see it's pretty straightforward. Um, all right. Um, there's a DOE exercise. I'll cover this at the very end. It, it, there's a macro in this embedded chart. Um, and then there's a few uh, assignments. You can see there's not anywhere near the same. This is the only slide. Many are optional. Uh, there's, a couple of, uh, there's a couple of articles I, that um, I'd like you to read. The Nut Island is optional. That's in Teams and Teamwork. That's about a story about how uh, a sewage treatment plant team that was the top team uh, kind of fell apart in what they were doing. Uh, Oops is meant to be a fun um, uh, article, and it's about if anybody used to watch, uh, what was that show, The Apprentice? It's basically a discussion of that and what goes wrong on that or what are some bad tips that you can learn from The Apprentice. Um, but it uh, lines up with behavioral analysis. We've got a couple of uh, measurement systems uh, exercises, which are these right here. And then we've got a couple of uh, exercises. And notice, again, most are optional, but in terms of optimization and in terms of queuing. And this is real optimization. This isn't the, quote, optimization that you always hear about and read about in the New York Times or in Wall Street Journal. This is true optimization. Um, so um, for this one, you're going to need the Excel solver. It's a free utility that comes with Excel. Uh, for this one, oops. For this last one, you're going to need to install a QTP add-in uh, for the queuing, um, which is in your tools folder um, uh, in order to do it. Uh, there are also very detailed vi uh, videos on how to do that. So um, if, it's present if it presents you with any problems, again, you can pick up the phone and call. Um, uh, and that's about it. I mean, there's one section on pinpointing, which is Chapter 10. And then there's discussions about, this is, again, this discussion in writing uh, with your own. Um, so it shouldn't really take that long. This is an optional exercise, <clears throat> the DOE one. And uh, if you haven't noticed, I've been harping on, um, I've been harping on uh, pie charts. Um, I, I think they're not very effective in a lot of cases. And this is actually an experiment that you can run to see if uh, the pie charts are just as good as bar charts or stacked bar charts or whatever. I don't want you to overthink this, but this is basically an experiment that you can run. And I'm going to show you how this works. So I'm just opening it up directly from this. So here I've enabled this. And you can see there are some pretty simple instructions. <clears throat> you want to click the button. You want to note the color that you're going to assess and assess the area that's covered in percent and uh, your the data is written on the data sheet. So essentially all you need to do is to run it is to click this. And I think I said uh, in the assignment here that we want to do 15 data points for each chart. So we're going to look at 45 charts total. So we're going to go through 45, 15 of these. I'll just show you how it works. You click on this and it says I'm ready to experiment. Okay, great. And basically, what you're going to do is you're, you're going to look at the chart. I'm sorry, you're going to look at the color, and you're going to guess at the percent. Okay? All right. So it says I'm going to look at the blue, and I need to guess the percent. I'm going to guess uh, 90%. Okay? Now I'm going to look at the chart again. It says red. Okay? Now I'm going to guess at the percent. I'm going to guess 20. Okay? And now I'm going to guess at the percent, and it says I need to look at yellow. Whoa, I'm going to guess a zero, etc. And you keep going, and you do that 15 times, okay? And after you do 15 of those, your data values are all written in here, and I want you to analyze the data, okay? 
what's written in here are the differences in percent from what your answer was and what the actual was. Okay? So that's that. And uh, the discussion in here is really about, okay, so now we've run this experiment, right? We've done this comparative experiment. What, what's good about this experiment? What's bad about this experiment? But the idea is to show you, you can jump in and do these things and kind of understand uh, uh, to a certain extent what's done to get a good experiment, what, what makes an experiment go wrong. Um, and it gives you a little more uh, flavor for actually running the experiment. I mean, that's in lieu of actually doing the real experiment. This is at least something that you can, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> try with yourself and, um, and uh, see how that works out. And hopefully there's some learning that you get back from that. Okay, and if you want me to be the guinea pig, I'm happy to be the guinea pig. Call me up and you can run the experiment on me. Okay, so that's it for the, um, for the assignment. Shouldn't take anywhere near as long, probably just a few hours um, uh, to do it. Um, okay, um, <clears throat> so without further ado, I guess I'm going to stop. Do you, are there any questions on this or the previous homeworks? I know, John, you had one, and um, um, we can uh, cover that uh, together uh, sometime this week or on Friday if you want to call. What questions do you have? Any questions on the existing one that I think is due? Uh, is it due today? I think so. Okay. No questions on the DOE. Okay. All right. So, um, all right, um, so uh, that's, a, that's about it. Um, I'd like to uh, finish where we were on control charts, and then we'll go into behavioral analysis, which is in week seven, the first section. Um, we'll go into FMEA, which is the second section, and we'll cover uh, MSA, or measurement systems analysis, part one, uh, which is uh, also in week seven. It's near the end. Okay, before we get started, are there any questions on the assignment, you know, all the regression, DOE? Okay. Mark, this is Regina. I yes. have a question. Yes. Um, I'm just pulling it up. It was on the, uh, actually it was on the advertising assignment, which was Exercise 2 DOE, it's on slide 64. Yes, okay. Yes. And one of the questions was, is the main effect placement uh, confounded with any two-factor interactions? And I uh, used Minitab. Okay. And so it listed uh, a whole list, it says the following terms are totally confounded with other terms and were removed. And it has um, color times placement times free offer, color times placement times day. So I was getting hung up on the question where it was saying with any two-factor interactions. Okay, got it. So, so let's take a look at that. All right, so this one right here. Yes? Yes. Okay, great. So let's take a look at this, and I'm going to start it out by looking in DOE Helper. Okay, I'm going to show you okay. basically what this is. So um, let me open that up. Okay, I think it was 16 trials. Yeah. Okay, so um, <clears throat> for fun, <coughs> excuse me. All right, so here we've got um, our different factors, A, B, C, D, E, and our result, right, our response. Okay, and I've got 16 runs, and I've got uh, uh, five factors. Okay, so the first thing to think about is, is um, let, me go to, let me go to DOE Helper, and we're going to check the resolution. Now, why am I going to check the resolution? It's because resolution is related to this confounding. So let's, let's see that. So I have five factors, and I have 16 runs. This means it's, this says it's a res 5 design. Okay? And that's good, right? It's green, so that means it's good. So far, are you with me? Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, great. So um, the question was, and I'm going to open up the question on my um, on my uh, my slides here, and that's week six, slide fifty-three, I think, or something like that. Slide uh, sixty-four. Sixty-four. Looks like I had it off in the book. Okay. Okay, great. Great. So it says, what resolution is the design? Is the main effect aliased with any two-factor interactions? Okay. So, Res 5, um, does anybody remember what that means? Res I know that it, isn't it like the 1 plus 4 and the 2 plus 3? That's three. right, that's right. So, okay. so let's take a look at that. Whoops. Let's take a look at what that is. So this says it's a res 5. Oh, that's going to be great. White on <laughs> white on white sheet. Okay. So we've got uh, we've got the the main effects, the mains, which is really the one factor interactions like a, b, c, right? We've got the two factors, and we've got the three factors. We've got the four factors, and we've got the five factors. Okay? So far, so good? Yep. All right. The two factors are things like uh, what? They're things like uh, B, C. A, B. Yep. A, B, A, B. B, B. Perfect. Okay. And the three factors are things like what? Uh, A, B, C. D. Well, we don't have D, E, F, <laughs> but we could have no. a C, D, E, right? That would be yeah. an example. All right, and so forth, right? The four factors would be things like A, B, C, D, and there's only one factor, five factor, it's A, B, C, D, E. Okay, so a res 5 means the worst case, it tells me about the worst case confounding or the aliasing, right? Uh, confound, <coughs> excuse me, confounding and the aliasing are the same things. Why statisticians use two terms for the same thing, I don't know, but they do. So we have a res 5. So if I think of, <clears throat> excuse me, if I think of, you know, one of the confounding things, maybe like a res 5 would mean that the one-factor interactions, the main, the main effects, are confacted with the four factors because 1 plus 4 is equal to 5, right? So, for example, A might be confounded with, um, I'll put an equal sign here. It might be confounded with D, uh, I'm sorry, with B, C, D, E. And B might be confounded with A, C, D, E, and so forth. So I'm not going to worry about this because if I get an A main effect, I, from sparsity of effects, I'm not worried about this. I cross this out essentially and I say I don't care about that confounding. So the bottom line is since this is a res 5 design, the main effects, the worst things that the, the worst confounding that we have is with the four factor interactions. Those are the lowest order interactions that the main effects are confounded with. So if I look at is the main effect placement uh, alias with any two factor interactions, the answer is no. Ah, uh, got it, because it, it's not a possibility. Right, not confounded. <clears throat> exactly. And if we look at, and, and there's a couple of different ways to find that. Now, I'm going to show you, you know, the brute force method in, in, in DOE Helper, and I want to show it to you in Minitab, too. If you're using okay. Minitab, then, you know, let's go through and, and look at this. So here's the brute force. I've got, uh, these. this is what I've got. I'm just going to mark those as green. And if I look through here, I can brute force look through all of these right here. I'm not going to find any that exist. Like AP, nope. BJ, nope. CM, nope. DL, nope. EO, nope. FN, nope. HK, nope. If I go through all of these, I will not find any. Um, well, now, wait a second. That's not true. Oh, well, here it is. Here's AC and BC and all this. Those exist. Yeah, but L doesn't. <laughs> So uh, I really wanted to go through these. So that was a, that was a stupid thing that I just said on going through the bottom. I really mm -hmm. wanted to go through the ones on the top, and you'll see that there's none of these that exist. 
Um, if you look through it carefully, none of these two factor interactions exist. BK doesn't exist, CL, DM, none of those exist. So that answers your question, sort of brute force, right? Um, another way of doing it is to do it in Minitab. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it very quickly in Minitab <clears throat> so that you see it. And if you aren't using Minitab, that's definitely one of the things that Minitab does better. <laughs> um, Dewey Helper is great for doing only exactly what it does. If you want to do a little bit more than that, um, it's, it's, you know, it's not the greatest tool. Um, uh, so I'm not going to apologize for that. It is what it is. Um, Never marketed it as a saleable product. Okay, so we've got this right here, and <clears throat> let's do a DOE. <coughs> excuse me, on this. So the first thing is stat DOE factorial. I want to analyze the factorial design because I've already got it. If I read this, it basically says it doesn't have a design by Minitab. Do you want this Minitab to do it? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, so I need to tell them the factors. Oops, I need to select them. Oh, now, wait a second. What's going on? There we go. I need to do this for some reason. There we go. Um, and I need to have the response in there. And then it will analyze it for me. And there, Minitab just analyzed the design for me. Um, and it gives me the B factor is... Uh, is uh, uh, significant, so is C, and so is BC, which is probably what you got. Um, I hope it's what you got by doing um, DOE Helper as well. Now, you'll notice <coughs> that um, it has this stuff up here where it's, it's, it's mapping, <coughs> excuse me, A to color, B to placement, C to free offer, and all that, and it's goofy. Um, okay. And it also gives the alias structure. All right, now, I wanted to check this. Now, if you have Minitab 16, it may be giving you the words here instead of the A, B, C, D, and so forth. So, Gina, did yeah. you get the words here? I got the words. It says, like, color uh, times placement times free offer. So it's listing, like, 9, yes. 12, 14 different... It's confounding like, terms. It's super hard to read, right? So Minitab... It's not as easy. <laughs> right. So Minitab finally got smart and, and said, no, whatever the case is, we're just going to give you A, B, C, D. Um, and you can see it's actually pretty easy that all the main effects, they're not confounded with two-factor interactions. You got can it. see that right here. And this actually makes sense with the resolution, right? 1 plus 4 equals 5. And same with here, 2 plus 3 equals 5. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> it's all pretty straightforward. Um, um, my guess is, though, that if you go back through this in the old Minitab, I wish I had... Oh, wait a second. I do have Minitab 16. <clears throat> Let me see if I can... Oh, don't want that, whatever that was. I'm not sure what that was. Where's Minitab? Minitab 16. Okay, so I'm going to open up Minitab 16, uh, which should coincide to what you have. Minitab doesn't tell me what it is either. Nice, Minitab. Really enjoying this. I'm going to take that Minitab 17 out. Are you using 16 or 17? You know what? I'm looking, and it actually has the words, and it has what you're showing. It's 17. Oh, okay. I just was looking at the portion where... It had the words, so it does both in 17, it looks like. Okay, all right, well, that's great. Um, so, yeah, if you look at that alias table, <clears throat> then it tells you, um, you know, it gives you something called a design generator, generator which you probably never used in your life, um, and then it gives you the alias table. Um, if you're okay. using DOE Helper, you just look at those uh, two-factor interactions, and, you know, my answer is anything above two, and uh, I really don't care that much, so... I'm just looking at the confounding between the mains and the two-factor interactions and that stuff. Okay. Okay, great Thank question. Thank you. You're welcome. What other questions do you have about the assignments? Okay. Um, all right. So, um, 
All right, great. So um, I'm going to close this down. And uh, let us, as the rabbit said, get back to uh, our regularly scheduled program, which is the discussion about control charts. Now, um, remember, control charts are, um, are the voice of the process, right? So if we have our process right here, and we have our customers right here, right? And a control, ch and here's a measurement. Right, our KOV, our output measurement, a control chart kind of monitors through this KOV <clears throat> how well our process is doing, right? And it helps us separate out signal from noise. This idea of um, this idea of special cause variation, uh, I'm sorry, common cause variation, which is inside the lines, and special cause variation. And um, if we have a chart that looks like this. Um, let's draw a few things like here. I'll put one that's out. And connect the dots. And this is time. And this is my KOV, right? Uh, my writing leaves a lot to be desired here. And that's my limits. Um, and this middle one is usually green. Um, this one is usually the mean. This is the mean plus three sigma, and this is the mean minus three sigma. All right, and if it has this form, it's called a Schuhart chart. And it turned out, when we looked at that, that there were dozens upon dozens. Well, no, there were dozens. Maybe not that many. <clears throat> there were dozens of Schuhart charts. Now, the, the basics of Schuhart charts is, are, there's a, couple of, there's a couple of assumptions. One is that the charts are, um, there's some stationarity. Ugh. What the heck does that mean? Well, what that means is essentially you're saying that over the course of what you're charting, um, that the, the distribution of the points remains stable. So, I, ooh, no, excuse me. There's stationary. The first one means that there's, um, there's not a lot of, um, um, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's fine. What I was saying in the beginning made sense. So the, the distribution over this remains the same over the course of this. So in other words, if you've got a changing distribution, um, uh, the three sigma, that this is exactly three sigma, goes out the window. Now, you still calculate it the same way, but it works sort of like a hypothesis test. Remember in a hypothesis test, we assume something that we think is actually not true. And then we, when we get data, we say, aha, see, the p-value is low, therefore I reject that null hypothesis that it wasn't true. Um, that is, like, if I give somebody a, uh, a, a, a drug that I think is going to lower their cholesterol, if I give that to a lot of people, I might say, on average, I expect the, a the average cholesterol to be lowered. What it, the way my paradigm works is I write my null hypothesis that says mu is equal to mu zero, right, versus my HA, which is mu is not equal to mu zero, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. um, so that's exactly how a control chart works. If the process is in control, if it's stable over that time period, then yes, then the limits are set at mean plus or minus at plus or minus sigma, uh, three sigma. If, on the other hand, the process is not in control over that entire time frame, it's not ex it's not really three sigma. It's set at whatever the estimate is, but it's not going to be exactly three sigma. So that's the first thing. That in terms of uh, the way that this all works, isn't anything to really worry about too much. Um, we just go ahead and use the limits and work on our on our uh, mirror, <coughs> go on our merry way. I will have a comment to say about this when we choose attribute charts at the very end, but uh, for the moment, let's just leave that alone. The second assumption, though, <coughs> is a little bit different, and that is that there's no serial correlation. I'm not going to talk about this too much in this class, 
But <coughs> an example of this is the stock market. The stock market has what's called serial correlation. And so normal control chart methods should be used with com some caution. What does that mean? What serial correlation means is that this data point right here, and I'll draw it in, uh, yeah, okay. I know you don't like that. Here we go. I'll draw it in green. This data point right here, if I had serial, serial correlation, is affected by this, this point right here. In a, in one of the classical assumptions of a Schuhart chart is that successive points are not related to each other. They are independent of each other. They're like dice rolls or coin flips, okay? So this value right here uh, is not dependent on this one, and this one right here is not dependent on its previous points and all that, okay? So um, if you look in, for example, Minitab, Minitab has a lot of things that have um, uh, uh, serial correlated charts. Um, now we're not going to get uh, detailed into that, those are some modern charts that are, you know, very, uh, let's say, very 1990s and uh, even 2000s. Um, we're not going to get into that. Um, suffice it to say that most processes um, will really benefit from using the cleaner chart, or the, the simpler charts. And uh, Schuhart charts are the simplest ones that there are. The individual chart is probably the most simple chart. And the lucky thing about it is that it works really well. It works in a lot of cases, um, and, uh, and it's the appropriate chart in most cases. All right, so, I, but I wanted you to know about that just before we go on. Um, now, we were talking about three types of, of Schuhart charts. We talked about the I chart, um, which was, and they, by the way, they all look exactly the same, right? We talked about the P chart. And we talked about the C chart. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the I chart is for continuous variables. Uh, variables. Okay. And uh, it estimates its sigma by uh, looking at uh, between measurement variation. I'm going to go over this again so that we remember this. Um, we'll go over this uh, specifically, but it looks at successive points and it looks at the difference of those points. So in order to estimate its limits, it looks at, for example, this point and this point. It takes a subtraction in the y distance, okay, and it says, I'm going to use this to estimate my sigma, right? Because that tells me a little bit about the, the variation of these points. And I'm going to do that again on the next data point and on the next data point and so forth. Okay, so it's using between sample variation. Now, because of this, it turns out that it's a great chart to use in a lot of cases. Um, one of the reasons is because it has a very robust estimator for what that distribution is, so it's very flexible. Okay? Mm -hmm. So this is appropriate for things like if you're measuring cycle time, if you have a performance measurement. But the nice thing about it is it also, let me erase this for a second. It's also, um, <clears throat> should have left myself a little more room. It's also uh, works in uh, all cases. So it works in P chart and C chart, C chart included cases. Okay, and why is that? It turns out that because when I have a lot of data, my P chart gives me something that's more or less continuous. Think about it. If my, <clears throat> if my, if I'm looking at the proportion or the percentage of of juice cans. Let's say I'm measuring juice cans that are coming off of a manufacturing line. And we can put that into, into our language, right? I'm measuring loan applications, the accuracy, whether they're correct or not, coming off of an application line. Or I'm measuring appointments and looking at a, you know, a hundred point checklist and seeing which ones are correct and which ones are not. 
or I'm looking at an optical table and I'm looking at which ones are 100% right or, and, and 100, which ones are uh, have flaws. Each one of those cases fits analogously into this. If I have, if I'm looking at many appointments, say one point a week, and I'm looking at 100 appointments, well, I've got a lot of different percentages that I could get. On the other hand, if I'm only looking at five appointments and looking at the percentage of that, it's not really going to be continuous. I'm, I'm limited to the number of answers that I can get there. So uh, if I, in the case where I have 100 appointments and I'm looking at that, the eye chart's going to be fine. It's going to be great. Um, um, so I could use either one of these. Um, likewise, the same thing if I'm counting up defects. If instead of the optical table one, I'm look, in, instead of looking at whether it's perfect versus whether it's not perfect, I'm looking at the count of the number of defects on a table, um, or I'm looking at a count of the number of defects in a loan application, or I'm looking at the count of defects in, a, in an appointment. Um, <clears throat> in each of those cases, if the, my potential count is very high, then maybe I could use an eye chart anyway, and it, wouldn't, uh, and it would come out about the same. All right, so just keep that in mind as we do these examples. All right, now, just to remember then, the P chart, um, we said, uh, uh, so, so the, the answer is you can always use an I chart. You can always use an I chart. It's never the wrong answer. <laughs> so if you just want one answer, go ahead and use that. However, there are times when the P chart and the C chart can be a little more sensitive and so they can detect changes a little bit more quicker. And so uh, we want to know at least what are the cases where we could use those. And uh, do you remember what the, what the words were? So P chart stands for what? Proportion or percentage. You got it, percent or proportion. And uh, the C chart stands for? Count. Counts. Counts. That's it. It's really, it's really that simple. So if I'm looking at, um, if I'm looking at, let's do a loan application. Okay. And I did this poorly. Oh. <laughs> I want it to all be red. Hey, come on. There we go. I don't know why I wasn't getting my white pen there. But okay. And let's say there were, this is a single loan application. And there were, it looks like an ice cube tray of old. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Let's say we have 14 chances for error. And we found that there was an error there and an error there and an error there. And we looked at successive ones of these. This might lead us to a C chart, right? Because we're counting up errors. Does that make sense? On the other hand, if we looked at, okay, I don't care how many are wrong within this. I'm just looking at, is it right or is it wrong? And counting up, say, in a batch of 100, <clears throat> what's the, how many were, how many had, uh, how many were in error and how many were not, that's going to lead me to a P-chart. Okay. Hopefully that makes sense to everybody. All right, so now what I want to do is I want to take you through... Um, uh, just what are some of the patterns that you might see? And all this, by the way, is explained in the in the notes um, in much more gory detail uh, uh, than I think than we want, as well as some of the calculations. Okay. Okay. So um, so let's take a look at that starting on slide 153. This is in section six. Um, so I want to show you some, what are some t typical pr patterns that you'll find um, <clears throat> to look for. And what I've put in here is voice, both the voice of the customer and the voice of the process. In other words, I've put a histogram in there as well. And I find that it's helpful to always look at both because sometimes one chart will show you one thing and a, uh, another chart will show you something else. So um, it's always good to look at both when you're, when you're doing that. All right, so here's an example of a control chart when you have a stable process. Um, generally, you'll find a histogram that, depending on the number of points, will be uh, bell-shaped, or sometimes it can be skewed, too, but in any event. You know, the recommendation here is uh, all the data are relevant. If you have problems, it's a good project to maybe work on because you're looking for deep sources of variation. 
Um, here's an example of special causes. Um, so um, <clears throat> this is, uh, this is uh, our typical plus or minus 3 sigma. If you look at a histogram, often you'll find things like this. You have points that are way off to the right-hand side. Um, here's an example. Sometimes when you have skewed data, um, you'll find things like this. Now, the recommendation, I'd say change of scale and do a transformation. I would say uh, at the bottom there, I would say do that sparingly. The first thing is to investigate for special causes if you don't have too many. Sometimes this happens and you've just got so many that are out there. But the bottom line is, in looking for errors or fixing your process, it does make sense to focus on those high-end uh, things anyway. So it behooves you to start to look into some of those things. Um, here's an example of something that you'll sometimes see. Now, I've, very, uh, I've put it very deliberately into here. Um, uh, you don't usually see it so clearly, but this is a cycle. Um, cycles, are, cycles are tough to deal with. Um, uh, you might have to find what's causing that cycle, if it's, if it's day or if it's, if it's maybe a shift or maybe it's uh, practices that change during the day. Staffing can be, can be uh, problematic there. But if you do need to remove variation out of a process like this, you need to identify what those cycles are. Um, here's an example of a trend that you might find. So trends are kind of interesting. You get really funky, uh, if you see a real funky uh, histogram, um, it's not quite skewed, or maybe it's skewed on one side, but there's a trailing edge on one. Um, you, might want to want, you might want to take a look at the time series as well, or the control chart. Um, this is one of my favorites. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you'll see a control chart like this, and it looks like it's in control, but when you look at the histogram, you actually have two humps. It's bimodal. So um, this is, again, something that um, if this is your problem, great. You've identified what you need to fix. If it's not, you might want to chart the two groups separately um, because then you're eliminating a lot of variation between each group, and you'll be able to spot uh, changes pretty quickly. Um, sometimes you'll see data that looks like this, and uh, in other words, there's not many values. Um, it's either, I put this as either it's high, medium, or low. If this is, um, uh, if you see this, what you've probably got is you've picked like a, uh, an I chart when you really need a P chart, or you're just not getting enough, you, you just don't have enough data or you're truncating it. Um, so the example might be, um, yeah, I, I sample 10 invoices or 10 loans every, every week and I'm measuring whether everything's right or everything's wrong, and yeah, it's most, most of the time it's zero. Um, uh, when I have something like that, what, what ends up happening a lot is you, you, you over-control things so that you'll, you'll find that every time there's any issue, let's say you find one loan application that's in error, it's saying, oh, special cause event. That's, that's just not the greatest measurement. You probably have to think about the measurement that you want to use. Um, one measurement, and I want to talk about this in just a second, we'll come back after we finish this. Okay, good, that was the last one, is um, I want you to think about, and, and, and it's not really in the book, so, so this is, I think, a good point of, 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 of discussion. And um, John and I talked about this, in fact, um, and this comes up a lot when you're looking at errors over time. Um, one of the problems with... Um, Let's say you were looking at, the classic one is safety inspections. So we're going to do safety inspections. Okay, so uh, what, here's a typical thing that people might chart or put on a control chart. I want to look at the number of safety inspections, or the number of, uh, number of issues, um, and I look at it per week. So this is week one, this is week two, this is week three, whatever. I could, I could label these. And the problem with a, a lot of these, what happens if you go to, a, uh, let's say, a, 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 a plant that, that, that's really got, good, it got its safety down well? Well, the problem is sometimes you get zeros. Zeros. Oh, I got one. Zero. 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 
And, and this isn't really very helpful, right? We have a control chart that, regardless of whether the red line is above that one or just below it, let's say it's just below it. <clears throat> if it's just below the line, then what this is saying is that, geez, every time I have a safety inspection, it's a special cause. Well, maybe that's okay, but wouldn't I rather get it sometime during the week when, the, when I actually find the inspection? So, <coughs> and it's hard to tell whether I'm getting better or worse on a chart like this. So what I might want to do instead of doing this is I might want to look at instead time between issues. Or time between, um, yeah, between issues. Or between errors. So this takes a little more uh, effort because I actually have to measure the time between when the last error was and when this particular error is, and I don't have a common scale that always fits in here. So now this is event. It's not date anymore. So my first event was, let's say the time between it was, was, was 20, and uh, then my second event, my second inspection event, I found that it was... Uh, 10 days I had to wait, but then my third one, it only took me one day or two days. My fourth one, it was only it was only two days again. Here's a process that's getting worse over time, and I could tell that pretty quickly by looking at this time between errors. So that's often a very powerful technique to use. If you have something that's very sparse or you have rare events, um, if you have rare events, uh, you might want to look at doing um, time between errors. And uh, whereas this is a P chart, right? This is a P chart or a, or a C chart. This now becomes a I chart. Okay? <clears throat> that makes sense. Uh, John, what was the example that we had? What was the one that we did? That was uh, orders over time. Okay, yeah, great. So it was, it was orders over time, and there was sort of a, we were looking at numbers of large orders over time as well. Right? Yeah, over, yeah, over, yeah, primarily over fifty thousand and over a hundred. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So we were trying to see if those events were getting rarer or if they were staying yeah. about the same frequency. And one yeah, way that was extremely helpful, by the way. Good. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> it's always good when it's when it's helpful that way. Um, uh, so so sometimes that can be a very powerful idea of changing a fixed. Here we have a fixed time scale, fixed time like weekly or monthly or whatever, and then here we're going to the between events scale. Anyway, so so you get a little power, and the 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 problem is, or the difficulty is. Um, this is now the X scale is a little bit harder to interpret for people. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. All righty. Um, I'll tell you what, let's do a couple of examples and then let's get be on our way. And uh, so I want to do uh, one of the examples or two of the examples at the back end. So, oops, I'm, I'm already telling you which chart to use, but uh, <clears throat> let's take a look at this. So. In this case, I have uh, time order data for, um, oops, I wanted to use, oh, come on, there we go. Uh, time order data for gas levels and parts per million. So this might be, um, I have a gas flow meter and I'm looking at the parts per million gas levels. Maybe I'm doing radon testing or something like that. I'm looking day over day and I'm looking at gas levels um, over 30 days. And it looks like this is a num, but let's open it up and find out. Um, and uh, uh, let's see, where do we go? Oh, I'm already there. Um, here, there's gas levels. And I need to have Excel stats open. So now I've got it open. I'm going to go ahead and use my control. Okay, this is numerical, and I got to get the data in there, so I'm going to do that. Clear out the existing data right now, and then I'm going to paste it in, um, 
And I'm going to show you the fancy way of doing that this time. Where is my other data? Here it is right here. I'm going to copy and go back to Ugh. Oh, I see. I've got to close this thing. Yeah. You know, sometimes it doesn't give me my uh, my bar at the bottom. Okay, now I did copy the header, so I'm going to click on this and just paste. And there it is. And I know I got it right because it filled in the rest of these. I can come over to here. And my interpretation should be, <coughs> yep, it looks like gas levels have remained stable over that time, but I do want to be um, checking some of these other things, right? Because now we have these other rules where we're looking at so many points a row, above two sigma and stuff. Now, that's hard to, <coughs> excuse me, it's hard to check, but I want to be watching this for downward trend. I'm, I'm definitely looking at this um, like a hawk. I've got a couple of points that are really close. So I'm not ready to react yet, but um, uh, it looks like it's remained stable, um, but I'm keeping my eye on it uh, uh, now. Okay. Hey, hey, Mark, before you leave there. Oh, sorry. Yes. <laughs> I just left. Is it possible in uh, Excel start, uh, starts to add uh, one sigma and two sigma line on that chart? Um, it is possible, but there's no automatic uh, adding. So um, okay. let me show you how you can fake it out, okay? You can add mm -hmm. in a one sigma and two sigma uh, line. So let's just, let's just do it with this, right? So um, uh, if you actually uh, look at it, you can put in, see where it has these lower and upper spec limits? It says USL and LSL. All right, yeah. now, I do not recommend putting these on your chart, but if you wanted to put a one sigma line and two sigma lines, look what happens when I click on this. It gives me two additional lines on the chart. Now, if you want to put them at one sigma and two sigma, you actually have to figure out what those would be and, and then okay. put it in there. So let's see. So if, it's, if the center line is 10.4, and let's call this, or 10.5, and this looks like it's uh, 11, right? So 2 sigma would be about 2 thirds of that way, so that'd be about uh, a half to this, it would be 0.75, is that? No, that's not right, 0.75, point, point, uh, I don't know, let's see, 10 point, uh, 10 point, let's just make it 8, 5, and uh, this would be uh, 10.15, something like that. And you could put those on the chart, and there they would be. Now, I got it wrong a little bit, so why, I'm trying to think of why I got it wrong. But uh, uh, Oh, no, that's, that's pretty close. Um, so that puts it at two sigma. Um, and if you want to put on one sigma, you could just add some other things. But there's no automatic uh, way of doing it. Okay, I see. Okay. okay. All right. Um, uh, we're going to, I, I know you pinged me for a talk on fr to get together on Friday. I do have a template that does put on not one sigmas, but two sigmas uh, called a zone chart um, that some people like to use. Uh, it's not something that I cover all that much, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I'll show you it. And uh, if you like it, I can give it to you. Okay. Okay. But not standard in Excel stats. Great question. Okay. okay. Thank you. You bet. Um, let's do uh, let's do another example um, before we move on. Uh, let's do um, let's see if I can um, let's see if I can fix this one. So I want to open up late services. So in this case, it looks like I've got a situation where I've got a company, they pull a number of accounts, and they check to see if they were late or not. Um, so um, uh, if we wanted to look at the, uh, let's say we wanted to look at the proportion late. Uh, yeah, let's say they wanted to look at the proportion or percentage of lates. 
Um, what chart would we use to look at that? <laughs> Try not to be too obvious, but... P-chart. We might use a P-chart, yes. Okay, great. So let's go ahead and use a P-chart. And um, uh, uh, why don't I have one of you guys walk me through that just so that you get it. Uh, can I select a volunteer? Uh, Gina, was that you who said that? Yes. <laughs> okay. Why don't you? Why don't you? I'm going to give you control of my uh, screen, and uh, why don't you go ahead and do that? So uh, let's see if I can give you the control. There we go. Okay. So you should have control now, and yeah, just kind of walk through that. Oh, you know what? I have to go and clear it first. You got it. All right. Good. So. You know, doing this in uh, Excel stats, it takes a little bit of love. Good. It's, a, it's attribute. Yep, P and NP. And then if you click on data, you can clear that out. Whoops. I've got something in the way. So, okay. All yours now. Sorry about that. Good. So now that clears it out. Back to the data. Oh. How come I can't grab it here? Uh, try Let me try now. down here. Try it now. Okay. There we go. And we don't do the headers. Wow, you remember a lot. You have a good memory. Yeah. <laughs> try that again. Awesome. And paste it. And that's it. It's really as simple as that. Um, let's take a look at this. Thank you, Gina. So let's take a look at this control chart now for a second. And uh, and uh, what's the interpretation that we have here? This is a process that uh -huh. is blank. This is. Um, I, I'm just looking at my notes. Um, all of the data falls within the upper and lower limits. Yep. And it looks like um, it passed the Westinghouse test. Okay. And it's just common cause variation, so I have that it's stable. You got it. Yeah, this is a stable process. Um, does that mean it's a good process? Nope. It does not mean it's a good process. In fact, if we look at this and think about what this is, 25% of these accounts are late. So even though it's stable, <laughs> it's pretty bad, right? So, okay. So the other thing is, why do you think we have these wavy lines? I didn't talk about that so much, but why is that? That's because of the sample size? Exactly. Because the sample size is different, the estimate for how much it varies, is, it changes uh, over this. And, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of an interesting tidbit. <coughs> um, the uh, in the uh, in the olden days, we used to have something that was called an NP chart instead of just a P chart. And what that was was you you fixed it and you multiplied both of these together to get an, a single number, and that just usually made it easier for people to plot it. But you could only use those charts when you sampled approximately the same size. Um, so in here, we could do an NP chart, and when I click on this NP, you'll see that it gets to be the same. Whoa. It didn't get the same. Uh, it should be. Um, use me. Oh, there it is, right there. Use the mean sample size. Use the average sample size to calculate the limits. Um, that's what we would have done in the old days, uh, just because it's uh, fairly straightforward and easy. Can you guys still hear me? Okay. Yes. Screen's okay. Yes. Okay. Good. Um, I'm just checking because I heard a couple of beeps and, and knowing how it didn't work so well the other day. Okay, great. So, um, again, you know, when control charts are all like this, there's not a lot extra that you're going to glean from this. Okay, nice job. Uh, let's do uh, one more, <clears throat> just so that we cover our bases. And uh, uh, let's look at, uh, in this case, uh, we've got the file absenteeism. Oops. And let's see. Um, 
And uh, in this case, um, what I've got is I measured employees week after week, and uh, the ones that were absent without telling me that they were going to be absent. Um, so they tracked the number of employees da employee days that staff is absent, and it says after week 15, management decided to take action about the high rate of absenteeism by chewing out the staff. Uh, a, was the reaction warranted, and, and B, do we see real evidence uh, for improvement? So it says, did it say after week 15? Yeah. So I guess that would be, uh, uh, it would be here, right there. They started chewing out the staff if they were absent. Don't ask me how they chewed them out because they probably weren't even there to do it. But, uh, uh, John, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to give me a hand with this one, if that's okay. Sure. All right, so I think I've given you the keyboards. I've got Excel stats open. So <clears throat> the first question is, you know, what chart do we want to use here? I'm going to guess uh, C chart, Mark. Yeah, C chart would be fine. And I chart would also be okay. Um, but C chart is probably the preferable one here. Yeah, so you remember, you got to give it, you know, there's alternate key was hit or something. Um, yeah, so you got to give a little love. We don't have the data in there. We have to get the data in there. Hold on, I lost. Uh, oh, you did? Yeah. Uh, where? Okay, it says you still have it, but. Uh, hold on. Yeah, I don't see the screen. Oh, you don't see the screen? No. Do other people see the screen? Yes. You can see the screen. Uh, okay. Looks like you're moving stuff around, John. Yeah, I see other things. I see Lotus Notes. I don't see, see the call in. Hmm. Uh, hold on. I don't see. Oh, okay. You know what? I have to clear out the data. There we go. All right. Yeah, you got to clear out the data. I, I don't see the previous screen. You don't need the previous screen. So this is not the right way of clearing out the data. So the way of clearing out the data is you click on data. See where it says data? Anything yeah. that's red is clickable. Okay. Yeah. That's how I've always been doing it. Oh, well, you know, it yeah, will probably work. <laughs> it will probably work, but... Try double-clicking on uh, data there. I don't know what you just did there. Hold on. <laughs> oh, it's gone. What happened? All right. I don't know where the word data went, but... All right. All right. Go ahead and clear out the data. Okay. There we go. <coughs> All right. Now you got to copy it. I don't know where my... Uh I don't know where the Excel file is. Okay. It's right here. There you go. Okay. Losing. It's at the very bottom bar. Can you see it? Yeah. I'm losing the uh, the meeting. You're losing the meeting. Okay. I think I'm going to have to, since you're having problems with it, I think I'm going to have to take over. Um, okay. Just, is anybody else losing the meeting? No, no I'm fine. Okay. okay. Only when I toggle over. Okay. Okay. So, um, so uh, John had copied this and put this in here, and now the problem oh, there, there is a problem with with pasting this is when, when I paste it, what data is it going to paste? Yeah, it pasted the count. It's just the column. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just one column in this case. This is the really the only data that we want is absenteeism. 
-hmm. And uh, if we paste that, that's fine. There we go, and, and, and that's our data right there. So I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to redo it the way that John was going to do it, just to show he wasn't full of it. <laughs> and he was on the right I made path. it, but, yeah. <laughs> but it did work for me when I did it. Yeah, so if you do clear it out, you know, you're not getting a lot of the, the advantage, but that's okay. We'll just copy this and plop it in. You just have to remember exactly where to play, place it. And and then you've got to fix the time because this mm -hmm. is a formula. So that's why it's a little bit more difficult. But anyway, I think uh, if you practice it a little bit, I think the clearing and pasting will work out well. So so the real question is, it says at week 15, uh, they decided to chew people out. Um, and um, the question is, is it getting better? Um, and I think the answer is, or the first question is, was it warranted? And the second question, is it getting better? Um, well, I think a lot of people would probably say, uh, yeah, it was warranted because look at that really bad week. But the reality is not all that much worse than a lot of other weeks. Um, it's not really special cause. So we better dig into this. Chewing out people seems like sort of a uh, treating special cause as if it's common cause. Um, problem. Um, and then the question is, did it get better after that? Well, there were a couple of points that were better, but as far as we know, it's just noise. Um, so there's no real clear answer that it really got better. Now, if we had seen six points decreasing, then yeah, maybe. But uh, we don't see an awful lot of evidence for the improvement. So um, bottom line is, um, if you want to fix this, you probably have to do more than just chew people out um, in this. Okay, um, so that's it for control charts. Um, uh, uh, after uh, the the shoe heart charts thing, um, so uh, why don't you take a minute um, if you have your books open and uh, write down um, um, in your view what are the key takeaways, and then we'll uh, walk into uh, behavioral analysis and FMEA and uh, cover those today. I think we can cover them pretty quickly. Just take one minute and then we'll go in. <laughs> it was mini tab talking to me there. All right, um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about some behavioral techniques um, that have been talked about in the book a lot, um, in the uh, Bring Out the Best in People book. Now, how have you guys been liking that book? Uh, uh, I hope you've been reading it. Um, um, uh, do you think that this is something that, uh, that sounds like it applies to your company? No answer. Yeah, I, yeah, Mark, I like. It. Yeah, so so basically, it's it's a discussion about um, behavioral psychology and how it might be applied in the workforce. And you know, one of the major uh, uh, lessons in it is that um, you can't just tell people what you want to have done. <laughs> um, you, uh, if you want the, uh, if you want desired behaviors, you have to work to shape them. Um, and I love the examples. There's a, re it's a classic. So the, the <clears throat> examples are getting a little bit old. They're from like the '90s, um, mid to late '90s. But uh, it's a classic for a reason. Now Aubrey Daniels has a lot of other books that are out there, and they're good. You're going to read one more article from some from a book called Oops which I think is something like the 13, I think he picked 13 on purpose, the 13 worst management mistakes and how to avoid them or something like that. It's also a book I recommend. It's less of a technique book than it is a fun book. Um, but anyway, uh, so let's talk about this. The three techniques that I want to talk about uh, in here, and there's really one that's a major 
quite uh, uh, quote technique is is ABC analysis. Now ABC analysis is something that you would do um, in a couple of different places, um, but let's and this is all from uh, uh, bring out the best in people, or much of it is from there. Um, so we're not going to go 100% slide by slide, but um, definitely talk through some of the beginning slides. Um, uh, after doing this, we'll be able to use a model to help us understand why certain behaviors occur more frequently than others uh, in a given individual or in a group of, of, of people. Um, the, the thing that I would like to impress upon you on this one is, um, now it went backwards, why did it go backwards? Uh, stable processes, yeah, let's get rid of that. Uh, the thing I want to impress upon you is this, that um, you, you're using it on a key output, but you want to have a very specific, uh, uh, you want to use this on a very specific group, or individual. And you may or may not want to, I'm not talking about doing something that's uh, Machiavellian here, but you may or may not want to share it with this individual, okay? But the, the key thing is ABC analysis is really just an analysis. It's a way of thinking about something in a constructive way that says, that can lead you to an answer that's maybe more systematic um, than uh, other things uh, might be, than just like taking a knee-jerk reaction to what would, what would I do? All right, so the first question is, <clears throat> um, uh, what percent of people's behavior is rational? And uh, do you guys have any thoughts on that? What, if I ask you that question, what percent of people's behavior is rational? You know, how would you answer that? I would say, how can you define rational? Because no. what's rational to you isn't the same to someone else. Right, okay, so, so you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about this um, nowadays. Has anybody heard of something called behavioral economics? Um, if no. you haven't, uh, there's been a lot of literature and people spend a lot of research dollars now in business trying to understand certain behavioral economics uh, points of view where <clears throat> a lot of the evidence points to people not being rational even if they think that they, even if they think they are and they think they want the things that they want, <clears throat> they're not being rational. But that notwithstanding, this model still works. And the answer is essentially, one answer is to say, well, if you look at the person's point of view, the behavior or the, the point of view of the performer, their, beha <clears throat> their behaviors are rational to them. Um, yeah. So the key thing is that the frequency of occurrence is not really determined by how desirable the businesses are or the, the behaviors are from a business or management point of view. I'll also want to say that these techniques uh, that we're going to learn, and sorry, I should have said this uh, early on, um, they work for um, they work for uh, process. Uh, they're going to be really good techniques for uh, process. Okay, and why for process? Because processes are repeated, and so repeated behaviors mean a lot. Getting somebody to do something once is not as, uh, as uh, it may be critical in a lot of situations, but in process work, that's not, the, that's not the critical part. It's the repeating of doing the right thing over and over and over again. Um, <clears throat> and the right thing may, I, I think the problem is that we've conflated this whole thing with uh, doing the right thing being some sort of moral objective and we want our employees to be moral of course we do just like we want ourselves to be moral or ethical we're not really talking about that we're talking about from a practical point of view what are the behaviors that are going to get us the most efficient and the most effective processes so that's number one the second thing is that the the place where this does not work where this really does not work is um, if the performer cannot uh, if the performer cannot do uh, cannot act out the behavior, um, then it's not going to work. Then no persuasion or shaping is going to work. Let me give you a for instance. Um, I don't know if any of you play guitar, 
and I happen to be a devotee of swing guitar, and early uh, uh, early 20th century music like Django Reinhardt. Okay, that's very difficult technically. Uh, if you were one of my students, I might scream at you till my lungs were blue uh, to say do it this way. But if you if you don't have the ability to do it, if you haven't practiced enough, you won't be able to get it right. Right. So no amount of screaming is going to work there. Also, no amount of reward is going to work. I could say, I'll give you a million dollars if you can do this right. Uh, that won't work either uh, if you can't technically perform it. Um, so just look for those sorts of things. This ABC analysis is not going to work uh, in cases where the performers can't actually perform. So if it's filling out a form correctly, uh, probably won't uh, work if they, don't get the if they don't have the training to do it uh, in the first place. Okay. All right, <clears throat> so um, th uh, this is also predicated, using ABC analysis is predicated on some research. Now the research, these numbers right here, 80 and 20, are highly suspect. They're too round to, for me to be comfortable with. However, um, one of my mentors, uh, Jim Hilgren, uh, assured me that the numbers were very similar to 80 and 20. Um, the idea is that a behavior uh, occurs because of two things. One is what's called an antecedent and the other is what's called a consequence. We are going to focus on the consequences. What is the difference between these two things? An antecedent is like an advertisement. Okay, so Coca-Cola spends a lot of money on advertising getting you to buy something and taste it in the first place. The consequence is everything that happens because of that behavior. So if I chose to buy that can of Coca-Cola and I drank it and I liked it, it was sweet, that might tend to drive that behavior again. If I didn't like it, if, I, if, it, if it tasted horrible to me, that, might, uh, that, consequent might that consequence might drive me to do something else. So we're going to try and be consequential in our thinking uh, as we're shaping these behaviors. So here are just a few of examples. Um, uh, if the phone rings, I answer it, I might get another assignment. Uh, if, you're, if you're me, that's a good thing. If you're somebody who's a, 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 a worker in a call center, maybe that's not what you want. Um, so that might be a positive consequence or it might be a negative consequence. It's not, not clear. Um, another example might be an antecedent might be a doctor tells me to lose weight. I might go jogging. That's one behavior I could do. Uh, I might lose weight as a consequence of that. Um, if I'm tired, I might say, okay, I'm using that antecedent of me being tired uh, for a behavior, drinking coffee. And I might perk up for a while. Or I might uh, have to go to the bathroom or something like that. Um, okay, and I think we get this. Uh, so, how does this work? Uh, what we're going to uh, do is we're going to score certain consequences. We're going to describe consequences and we're going to describe them in three dimensions. Whether that consequence is positive or negative for the performer. Remember when I said that you have to do this on a specific group? That's the reason because if you do it for a wide group they have all sorts of preferences and it's going to be difficult to say whether it's positive or negative and all this stuff. Second dimension that you want to score it in is if it's immediate or if it's going to happen in the future. Okay? And the third thing is if it's certain or if it's uncertain. Okay, now, <clears throat> once we do this and we look at the, beha the behavior and its complement, and I'll get to that in just a second, uh, and we, we score it on all of these three uh, 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 things, we say the behaviors that frequently occur, occur will have lots of picks, and the behaviors that rarely occur will have lots of nicks. Okay, a pick is something that is positive, immediate, and certain. So if something's positive and immediate and certain, it's a behavior that's probably going to happen. If we have something that is negative, immediately, and certain, it's probably something that won't happen. All right, so let's take a look at what this might look like. And this is, for example, driving, if I'm driving down the road, let's say I'm driving down the highway, and I want to analyze uh, a, 
a behavior that I that that if I were the police or if I'm me, um, I don't want to happen. And the compliment, okay, which is what I do want to have happen. So the first one is driving above the speed limit. And the second one is driving at the speed limit or below the speed limit. <clears throat> now, if I look at this, now you might argue whether it's uh, negative or positive or whatever um, uh, for you, but I just kind of did it for me. So uh, I look at some of these compliment, uh, some of these consequences. Um, for example, I might kill myself if I drive above the speed limit. Well, that's negative, but it's in the future. It's probably not going to happen right now. It's pretty uncertain. I, I, I know from past experience, every time I speed, I don't always kill myself. Or do I kill, uh, uh, it, does it happen now or even in the future? Uh, I might kill a pedestrian. That's also negative for me. I don't want that to happen. But again, it's future and it's uncertain. These two things have very little influence on uh, whether I'm going to uh, do the behavior. On the other hand, I get to my destination quicker. That's positive. It's immediate. I see it happening right away. And it's pretty certain. If I, if I put on that, uh, if, I, if I get a lead foot, I'm going to get there a little bit sooner. I get a rush of power, and that always happens whenever I step on the accelerator. Uh, I might get a ticket. That's negative. But again, it's future and uncertain. And I get to keep up with traffic. I have that guy that's on my bumper, who's uh, on my back bumper, who's really pressuring me to move faster. So I'm going to move faster, and that's going to give me, uh, that's going to be positive. I get to get a little bit of comfort, and it happens right away, and it's certain. So this is dominated by picks, so it looks like I'm being encouraged to drive above the speed limit. Now, again, what this is predicated on is, are these the top, really the top con uh, consequences that I care about? Um, <clears throat> so if you were doing this for real, you might start by brainstorming all the consequences. And try and keep in mind that you want both positive and negative consequences. When we use consequences in everyday life, we usually think of negative consequences. What are the consequences of drinking coffee? Most people would say, oh, you know, you elevate your blood pressure, etc. They wouldn't think of the positive consequences of it, right? Oh, it tastes good. It, it warms up my hands, uh, whatever. Um, okay. Um, uh, and then we can look at the, uh, we could look at likewise at the, the opposite, driving at the speed limit. And we can see that uh, there's a couple of different nicks in there, right? So there's a couple of things. That takes longer, and there are cars that are right on my bumper. And those are both negative things. I do feel good about driving at the speed limit. I feel like a good citizen whenever I do that. So that's a pick. So <clears throat> that's a place to start, is you start by analyzing this. And um, this shows you that if you want people to drive the speed limit, there are some natural uh, there are some natural things that are forcing them to, or that are kind of encouraging them to drive above the speed limit and discouraging them to drive at the speed limit. So um, just something to think about, not in terms of this, but in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of, how, of, of, what, of uh, what we're talking about. Now, now let's say that we were, uh, let's do a real quick one here. And let's stay, let's, uh, Let's do the behavior that we want. So this might be a behavior. Our behavior might be um, go to meeting on time. <laughs> I don't mean go to meeting. <laughs> <laughs> Show up on time for meeting on time. So we said earlier that this was a problem that we've had in, 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 our, uh, in our companies. It's a problem that most companies have. Get to meet uh, people showing up late for meetings, right? But this is get to a meeting on time. Um, we want to look at positive, immediate, uh, and certain, uncertain, future, and negative. If we look at what are some of the like, what are some of the consequences of getting to the meeting on time? What are the, some of the consequences? And we're just brainstorming here, but this is where you'd start. You'd start with brainstorming. Like, let me start out with. Uh, um, if uh, one of the consequences of getting to the meeting on time is I hear everything, hear entire meeting. Okay, what would be another consequence of getting to a meeting on time? You look reliable. I look yeah. reliable. Okay, what's another consequence? 
appear interested. I'm sorry? Appear to be interested. Appear interested. Can I say just put look reliable and interested? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. It looks good. Okay. So here's the tough thing. The tough thing when you're using this tool is just because it's what you want to have happen doesn't mean that the only consequences are good consequences. What's another consequence? What's a bad consequence of getting to the meeting on time? You have to sit and wait for everybody else to get there. I have to wait. What if I get there and everybody else isn't there? I have to wait for others. Right? What, what, what else? What's another one? That's a good one. Do, do I sometimes have to miss the end of my previous meeting? Or, <clears throat> like if I have meetings back to back? Anybody have that issue before? <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. And I know I've pushed you on a couple of these. That's one of the reasons why I leave that 10-minute cushion, <laughs> by the way, if you haven't figured that one out. Okay. Anyway, the, the, the idea, uh, I, I, I can't catch up on work. <clears throat> I know... Um, at the, uh, at the expense of being a little bit indelicate here, <clears throat> I've worked with executives all my life, and, uh, or half of my life, I guess, and <clears throat> being a doer, being somebody who gets a lot of the assignments, I hate going to meetings all day because then I have to spend my evenings doing everything, uh, doing all the work. Uh, so I don't like being in meetings all day. I, 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 I don't avoid them uh, necessarily, but I'm very selective. Okay, um, <clears throat> so now what we would do is we would evaluate these on um, positive or negative, immediate or future, and future or certain or uncertain. And so, um, so let's just kind of go through this. Here are the entire meeting. Well, that's positive for me. Is it immediate or future? Well, that's, it's immediate. It's immediate. It, it happens all the time. And, and is it certain or uncertain? Well, that's pretty certain. So that's a nice one. That's for generally a pick. Uh, I look reliable. Yeah, well, that's that's positive to me. Is it immediate or future? Well, it's I guess it's immediate. Is it certain or uncertain? Well, I don't know. Who else is going to show up to this meeting? And what if they show up late? Are they even going to know? I, I would say that this is uncertain. Now, that's for me. You might say, hey, this is certain. Uh, I like to use the 80-20 rule on this one. If it's about, you know, pick whatever one you think is about the right one. It's never going to be 100%. So I would say that's not quite certain. Uh, wait for others. That's negative for me. Is immediate or, or future? That's immediate. That's certain or uncertain? Depends on the culture. Uh, for me, I'd say it's uncertain. But if you have the culture where people are just showing up late all the time for meetings, that becomes a certainty, and you know what happens. <laughs> if everybody expects the meeting to start late, it will. Uh, miss the end of the previous meeting. Um, that's negative for me, that's immediate, and when it happens, it's pretty certain for me, etc. And <clears throat> you can see how this, I can't catch up on work, that's negative, it's, uh, it's immediate, and it's, and it's certain. Uh, you can see that there's a balance of nicks and picks here, and, uh, and uh, so forth. So um, this is a way that you would start. You'd probably want about eight or ten of these uh, behaviors. And uh, you might want to even, uh, you know, do a brainstorm and quickly uh, say with a group, you know, which, which ones are the most important ones they care about, and then do a quick picnic analysis. Now, what can you do about it? Um, what you can do about it is you can try to shape some of these things. Like, for example, uh, wait for others. Um, if we instituted a policy that we start when the meeting is started, um, that's going to make this a little more of a of a of a, 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 a um, uh, that's going to make this a little less important, right? So that's going to move this to uh, it just doesn't happen. I'm not going to wait for others, so it becomes less uh, it becomes less important. So it can it can drop out, um, um, uh, or if this were certain. Um, maybe we work to make this, uh, you know, uncertain, and this is future, etc. 
but these are these are these are difficult to to do this. If you want a behavior to happen, you have to look to add picks. Uh, if you want to make a behavior not happen, um, you want to look to um, add mix uh, to that behavior. So uh, this is the first part. You'd want to then list the, the complement of the behavior. So the behavior is show up late, and we do the same thing. We do positive, uh, negative, immediate future, certain, uncertain. We'd list the consequences for being late, like I catch up on work, I uh, hear previous meeting, whatever, right? And we look to try and stamp out the nicks here, or the picks here, okay? Like this is a pick. I get to capture, I get to work on my previous stuff, get to catch up on my work. That's a pick. So that's, uh, that's something that we'd have to work to maybe stamp out. Okie doke. Hopefully that makes some sense um, to you. Um, and there's lots of different places you can use this. Um, you can use it when you're analyzing data. That can help. It's especially helpful when you're planning an implementation and when you're standardizing. And one of the reasons why is that um, a lot of our solutions tend to be nicks, tend to nick people. Think about it, think about it this way. What happens when you're... Let's say you were working in a call center, okay, and you found that something in the way that the employees were doing what they were doing was making them inefficient. And so you removed that. Maybe it was a piece of after-call work. They finish the call and they have to do some stuff. You can show them how to be more efficient with that after-call work. What have you just created for the employees? You've made the process more efficient, but from the employee's point of view, is that good or is it bad? Hard to say, right? Because one consequence of doing things more quickly might be, I just get more stuff to do. So um, that can actually be a nick. So when you're designing processes, sometimes it's helpful to think about, um, you know, to use to use this just to see the lay of the land, and to say, you know, what are the things that we could do to maybe positively reinforce some people um, uh, in the process. Um, okay. Um, hopefully that makes some sense. Um, now I want to move to, uh, to just a second to, uh, to uh, reinforcement and then we'll talk about feedback and um, I think that we will uh, we'll see if I can just introduce uh, FMEA um, today, uh, but clearly we're not going to finish it. Um, I think I just want to talk about uh, 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 this one. So we're talking about reinforcement. So once we've done the ABC analysis, right, then we can look at, you know, how do we reinforce, how do we reinforce uh, behaviors? Reinforcement, this is a, uh, of behaviors. Ugh. Of behaviors. So what does this mean? <laughs> what does reinforcement of behaviors mean? Well, it means uh, trying to get the behavior to recur. That's what it is. Okay, so now we have two types of, of, uh, <coughs> of reinforcement. We have positive and we have negative. So what are those two? What is positive reinforcement of a behavior? Any thoughts? Anything that increases the likelihood of that occurring again? Exactly. Okay, so it increases likelihood of behavior. Increases likelihood of behavior. Likewise, negative is decreases likelihood of behavior. Okay, so uh, uh, without getting, remember, because there's all this stuff that kind of is put in the middle where we're talking about ethics and why can't we just get people to do, you should do the right thing. You know, we're not talking about that. We're really just talking about reinforcement is anything that increases the likelihood of a behavior and uh, negative, re uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement is anything that decreases that, okay? So we are positively reinforced. Uh, uh, so any, any thoughts on uh, positive versus negative, say, in, in terms of what should we try and use? Um, I, know, I know you probably know the right answer here because it's, there's really only one right answer by anybody who's a thinking person. But um, any thoughts on this? Which one should you prefer? <laughs> okay, so that's the right answer for sure, but why is the answer? Why is the question? <laughs> well, I think it's always look at from the viewpoint of the performer is most people react better to positive um, uh, reinforcement because it encourages them. Yeah. And positive will maximize where negative may only get you just get by. Excellent, excellent. So I think both of those things are very true. So the first thing is, <clears throat> if I want somebody to give what's called discretionary effort, that is effort be above and beyond what is acceptable behavior, right? Acceptable meaning, again, I don't want to talk about bad and good people, right? I'm talking about the acceptable behavior is to do the minimum that's required to get the results that we want. Uh, no, we want people to be able to do more than that, right? Um, and to be encouraged to do more. Um, so um, um, so um, if we positively re re reward people, um, there's, theoretically there's no limit. We can, we can increase that, uh, that maximum. Whereas if we, we negatively reinforce people, what we're really trying to do is keep people off that bottom, keep people from the bottom. Yeah. Okay, so it's that discretionary uh, uh, effort. Now, studies have been shown that positive uh, reinforcement uh, works a lot better anyway, and that we should look to do about five to one, between four and five to one, positive to negative, plus to negative uh, 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 reinforcers. So if we're trying to reinforce, um, we should definitely look for ways that we can positively reinforce. Now, I want to make sure that we understand that this is not the same as reward. Reinforcement does not have to be the same as reward. I think a lot of people think that that's the only thing that's going to motivate somebody who is, uh, you know, in a in a certain task or is doing a certain job is, well, we can't pay them anymore, or, um, you know, we, we we just can't do that. But there are plenty of other um, uh, reinforcers, uh, and we're positively reinforced thousands upon thousands of times uh, in a day. Um, one example is turning on a light switch. Um, that reinforces us to use that light switch, right? When we flip that switch up or off, uh, up or down, we see the lights. Uh, they change, right? So it reinforces us to use that switch. If it didn't work, right, if we flipped it up and nothing happened or flipped it down and nothing happened, we would stop flipping that switch very quickly. What, what, are, some, what are some examples of positive reinforcement that, that we deal with uh, daily? When I turn the key in your car and it turns on. There you go. I mean, yeah, I mean, some of the things are really that simple. How about one of, uh, how about an example of something that's designed, a designed reinforcement? And we might not like this one. We might even think it's evil, but does, does anybody play any of these uh, games on their phone? I know you're not going to admit it, but I'm going to admit that I play one or two, one or two of these games. Okay, now I, I don't make a habit of doing it, but if anybody has ever played something called Clash of Clans, now I haven't played it, but I've observed somebody watching it. There's so many things that they reward you for early to get you hooked on the game, and they're positive. They're like uh, little bing sounds, or they're they give you a they give you a little gift. Um, or they, they give you a free try, or they let you move a little bit quicker for a while. Um, they're trying to get you hooked, and those are positive reinforcements. You're doing the, quote, right behaviors, the behaviors that they want, <coughs> and they're reinforcing you for that. If anybody has ever been to Las Vegas or Atlantic City, you know that they positively reinforce you thousands upon thousands of times because you're getting some big negatives in there, and they don't want you to see those. 
Um, that's why there's so many bells and whistles and lights and stuff like that. Okay. So now, how do we how do we find good positive reinforcement? How would you do it if you wanted to positively reinforce somebody um, to get them to give more discretionary effort? And we're not being again, we're not trying to be evil for this. We're trying to we're trying to get the right process behaviors or whatever. Where are the, what are the different things that you might try? How might you go about doing that? I guess. Acknowledge their contributions in some form, uh, privately or um, publicly, depending on their preference. Do you know it? Okay. Yeah, so that's some specific things. So you could acknowledge, right? You could acknowledge. I think I spelled that. There we go. You could acknowledge. But, but uh, I think what you got to is that you know, not everybody's going to, let's, let's say, um, here, here's one thing that a lot of people give as a positive reinforcer for, or as a, quote, reward for people uh, for doing good Six Sigma work. A lot of people say, ooh, if you do good Six Sigma work, you get to present to senior management. What do you think about that one? Is that a plus or a minus? Is that a nick or a pick? I found out the minus. <laughs> it depends who you are, doesn't it? <laughs> now, if you're a loudmouth like me, it's probably a pick. I don't mind getting up and telling people about how great my project was. That's a little bit of a non-truth, but um, for the most part, I don't mind it. But to a lot of people, they're definitely afraid of public speaking, uh, of things like this. So it actually may, may be a, a real negative to them. Um, and I think that's the that's the key, is that it's it's got to be specific to performer. I'm just going to write it up here. Specific to performer. So it really matters uh, what you do. I'm, I'm not so much interested in, I guess I am interested in specifically what I'm going to give, but I'm looking for more general things. And the first general thing is it's got to be specific to the performer. So how do I, as a manager or as a process owner or as a process designer, <clears throat> find out the things that are really picks uh, to this per particular performer? How do I go about doing that? Well, let me give you the an, uh, an answer. I could ask them, right? I could say, "Hey, Steve, what do you what would you find to be positively reinforcing? What do you think about that idea?" Um, they may not uh, tell you the truth. They may tell you what they think you want to hear. Yeah, they may <laughs> they may tell me what I think I want to hear, right? They could they could tell me what I want to hear. Right? I mean, you know that happens, right? If you if you tell somebody what do you want, they're looking at well, I don't know, what do you want? <laughs> and uh, they'll tell you what you, they they want to hear. What else might be an issue with this? Well, they they could uh, they could uh, tell you something that that you didn't want to hear, like some, <laughs> you know something big. Yeah, they could say, well, look, the only thing that's going to motivate me is money. <laughs> right? They may tell you what you don't want to hear. <laughs> And it might not be productive, right? They may tell you things that you can't give to anybody anyway. Um, so that's, uh, they may tell you things that you can't give. Because uh, most people do think that their, their main motivator is money or, or whatever. Or you can send me on a vacation to Florida. Yeah, I'm so, or to, to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, I don't, Bermuda. Okay. I wanted to pick something that somebody wasn't already there. <laughs> Um, okay. Uh, also, they may not know. What's going to be positively reinforcing to you, Mark? I don't know. Let me go fishing every day? They may not know. Okay, so there, there are some issues with this. So instead of doing that, what, what might you also do? You might also, you might look to, um, uh, there may be a couple of different sources. So I'm going to just suggest a couple of things. First of all, you can try something. Try it. See if it works. <laughs> okay. Um, you're usually not that far off. If you know the person at all, um, you're usually not that far off. You could talk about, well, if you get this work done early, uh, if you get this specific work done early, let's say you're looking at a performer 
and they're a project manager, and there are certain tasks that they don't like to do. Um, <clears throat> you could talk to them and say, well, if you, get, if you do these, then it, once you complete that, then you're going to be able to do this, uh, this uh, cool work or this fun work. It's sort of like uh, uh, grandma's law, right? You eat your, first you eat your vegetables, then you get to eat the, then you get dessert. Okay? You might try something. And uh, if it works, great, stick with it. Um, that's, that's, a, <laughs> that's, not a, that's kind of a, a cop-out answer, but it actually does work. You might also look to peer group. Look to uh, peer group. Okay. What are the things that the peer group thinks that they can reinforce each other? Let me give you an example. I once worked with a, uh, uh, in a company that had a, dr a terrible call center. They were terrible technically. I don't mean the people. I mean the technology was terrible. And the people were, mm, I had the usual. I had some people who were really, really, really good and cared a lot. And I had some people who were paycheck players. They just came in uh, when they came in, but they were looking to avoid lots of work in the morning and stuff like that. Um, doing self-acknowledgement where they could nominate their own superstars, there was nothing except for you got a, your name with a little star up there and you got a nickname and maybe a star that you could put up in your office. Those were the only benefits of doing this. And I'll tell you, it made a big difference um, in even making calls. Um, um, so you can look to the peer group. Um, you can look to the process. Um, so a lot of times processes will give them, uh, will lend themselves to providing reinforcers. Um, uh, in this particular group, I used measurement <clears throat> plus visual board, and by the way, plus one-on-one -on -one visual board, and I'll explain that what that is in just a second, to make big, uh, a big difference here. So the measurement, let me just be, be simple here. When I got to this call center, they weren't even measuring how many people, uh, how many calls they made during the day. So we started doing that, and I created a visual board where management, who didn't want to do this, uh, physically went up to essentially a whiteboard and put a dot on every day. Uh, they created a time series plot so they could see, as a group, how many phone calls they were making every single day. How many, this was outbound call center. So that was that. However, we also set up one-on-ones so that this was public, but we didn't chew out anybody in public. We did a private one-on-one, -on -one, okay, where we were able to give people feedback one-on-one, -on -one, again via a graph, to show whether they were staying constant in their number of calls or if they were supposed to improve, whether they were getting better. Right? And we gave them a graph. Um, and this was something that we first started out doing weekly, and we got it to the point where we could do it daily with people. And, um, and that's another thing that's, uh, that's kind of helpful, is that if you can start doing the frequency of the feedback, we'll talk about that in just a second, but the frequency or how soon it is can really make a huge difference as well. Um, and, and that makes sense, right? If we look at that model, the ABC model, where we have uh, positive, uh, positive or negative, future or immediate, it's that immediate or future that, that makes all the difference there. If I know I'm going to get bad feedback, if I slough off for one day, and I know everybody's going to, uh, I know my boss is going to talk to me about it tomorrow, um, and, and they're going to use facts. They're not going to make it up, and they're going to show me a graph, and they're going to say, hey, what happened yesterday? Um, I'm going to have some splaining I need to do. So um, that's probably going to be negative to me. All right, so anyway, so that's looking to, the, you can try something. You can look to the peer group. You can look at the process. And, <clears throat> you know, if, if it's um, really kind of uh, uh <coughs> looking at management just giving all the attaboys, really coming in and saying, um, hey, you did a great job, that's wonderful, but management has a limited amount of time. So uh, this took a lot of effort, right, to set up one-on-ones 
especially when it was daily um, with all the people in there. We had to get that down to a really, really short meeting, otherwise it wasn't going to happen. I mean, these had to be five-minute meetings, so we had to have all the things, all of our artifacts down pat, and we had to have management be able to do that efficiently, otherwise they were going to waste all their time you know, in a meeting giving somebody feedback. Hopefully this makes some sense. Um, and uh, anyway, so I think I think it makes sense to uh, we've covered everything that's in the behavioral section. Um, next time uh, we will continue on the grid solutions. Whoops, on the grid, and we'll look into uh, FMEA, uh, which is a risk matrix. Okay. And you'll find that it's very similar to what we just did. Um, what we just did was we evaluated something on, on three dimensions, positive, negative, <clears throat> certain, uncertain, and uh, future and immediate. Um, in this case, in FMEA, we're going to do risks. Risk one, two, three, four, five. And we're going to evaluate it in three different ways. We're going to evaluate it on how severe it is. Uh, how likely it is, and how controlled it is. Okay, and we're going to come up with a score for each of these risks, just like we did with picnic analysis. Uh, we're going to do this with risks, and that's what FMEA is all about. All right, uh, so we will see you on. Um, uh, that's it for today, guys. I'll stay on the line a little bit. And uh, we'll see you on Friday. Remember, if you have any questions on the homework, on the new or the old, I'll be sending out that homework today. If you have any questions, uh, please um, don't be shy to give me a call. And uh, if you haven't yet scheduled uh, the project uh, discussion, uh, please email me sometimes, either uh, this week or next week, um, that you're available. Okay, take care, and uh, we'll talk to you later. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, thank you. Hi, Mark. It's Regina.